good to have Hardy at the center for fiction. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, we're going to take a huge leap through a 350-page book, and I'm going to summarize things in three minutes. But what happens to Jude soon after is Hardy does leave the childhood behind. And Jude pursues his apprenticeship and work as a mason. He continues with his private interest in books and trying to continue his self-betterment. He is tricked into marriage by a coarse and superficial girl, Arabella Don. And Arabella is introduced by Hardy in the book by way of a pig. And we have two constant animal metaphors here. We have the birds, as you have heard. They come into the book later with another character. But the pig continues almost every time we see Arabella. She introduces herself to Jude by throwing a pig's pizzle at him. So that's quite an introduction. And after they marry, their bedroom is above her father's pork shop. This is one of the famously horrific scenes in Jude the Obscure, which is the slaughter of a pig that Jude and Arabella own. Uh, the man that is coming to slaughter it does not show up on time. They must do the job themselves. Arabella has starved the pig so that cleaning the intestines is easier. Then she wants to bleed the pig slowly, and Jude is against this. It is a famously horrific scene, and you will be pleased to know I did not choose it as the next reading. <laughs> Eventually, Arabella abandons Jude, and he falls in love with his free-spirited cousin, Sue Bridehead. No accident in the surname there. He is warned, as you've already heard in this chapter, that follies are going to have some very fateful possibilities ahead of them, and one of them is not to marry, it's going to be bad, and not to fall in love. So now Jude is doing both. Uh, Sue goes and marries Jude's former school teacher. So we have two triangles in this book, and the book is often also admired for its structure. We have Sue, Arabella, and Jude, and then we have Sue, Jude and the schoolmaster. So, and they both overlay in, in quite neat ways with Arabella being the animalistic one and the schoolmaster being the other side of a kind of denied sensuality and being devoted to his books. All of this was much admired, those that did admire the book, for its modernity. Well, Sue is dreadfully unhappy in her marriage to the schoolmaster, and after much agonized indecision, she leaves the schoolmaster for a life with Jude. And remember, Arabella's already abandoned him. Now, ambivalent feelings serve Hardy well because this book was serialized. So one episode, they will get married. Next episode, they won't. They will, they won't. They will, they won't. And indeed, even the term we have today, cliffhanger, it came from another book of Hardy's which was serialized, and he left two characters hanging on a cliff. So that is, um, that is something that served Dickens and Wharton and many novelists uh, that were serialized. Sue and Jude never do marry. <coughs> and Sue's reluctance sexually and her interesting intellect also was a subject that D.H. Lawrence, our next program here in May, uh, Lawrence took great interest in this character and wrote about her extensively. He was a, a great admirer of Hardy's, and he felt that Hardy had created again a modern woman with modern conflicts. A boy has been born to Arabella that Jude did not know he had sired. Arabella has gone to Australia, and she sends this boy back to be raised by Sue and Jude. This melancholy child is nicknamed Little Father Time, and later in the book, quite aptly, abbreviated to 
little time. He is a sad child. He is mournful over the poverty of his family. Sue and Jude, they already have two children, and now they have little father Tom. They have to sell their possessions in order to continue. They cannot find enough lodging because it is explained to them they are too many. Little Father Time takes this very seriously and to heart. He does something from which none of the characters ever recover, and I think it is something that is a scene from which many readers have not recovered. Uh, this is a great risk in a novel. It is an unprecedented and shocking situation. Jude stood bending over the kettle with his watch in his hand, timing the eggs, so that his back was turned to the little inner chamber where the children lay. A shriek from Sue suddenly caused him to start round. He saw that the door of the room, or rather closet, which he had seen to go heavily upon its hinges as she pushed it back, was open, and that Sue had sunk to the floor just within it. Hastening forward to pick her up, he turned his eyes to the little bed spread on the boards. No children were there. He looked in bewilderment around the room. At the back of the door were fixed two hooks for hanging garments, and from these the forms of the two youngest children were suspended by a piece of box cord around each of their necks, while from a nail a few yards off the body of little Jude was hanging in a similar manner. An overturned chair was near the elder boy, and his glazed eyes were slanted into the room, but those of the girl and the baby boy were closed. Half paralyzed by the strange and consummate horror of the scene, he let Sue lie, cut the cords with his pocket knife, and threw the three children on the bed, but the feel of their bodies in the momentary handling seemed to say that they were dead. He caught up Sue, who was in fainting fits, and put her on the bed in the other room, after which he breathlessly summoned the landlady and ran out for a doctor. When he got back, Sue had come to herself, and the two helpless women bending over the children in wild efforts to restore them and the triplet of little corpses formed a sight which overthrew his self-command. The nearest surgeon came in, but as Jude had inferred, his presence was superfluous. The children were past saving, for though their bodies were still barely cold, it was conjectured they had been hanging more than an hour. The probability held by the parents later on, when they were able to reason on the case, was that the elder boy, on waking, looked into the outer room for Sue, and finding her absent, was thrown into a fit of aggravated despondency that the events and information of the evening before had induced in his morbid temperament. Moreover, a piece of paper was found upon the floor, on which was written in the boy's hand, with a bit of lead pencil that he carried. Done because we are too many. At sight of this, Sue's nerves utterly gave way, and an awful conviction that her discourse with the boy had been the main cause of the tragedy, throwing her into a convulsive agony which knew no abatement. They carried her away against her wish to a room on the lower floor, and there she lay, her slight figure shaken with her gasps and her eyes staring at the ceiling, the woman of the house vainly trying to soothe her. They could hear from this chamber the people moving about above, and she implored to be allowed to go back and was only kept from doing so by the assurance that if there were any hope, her presence might do harm, and the reminder, the reminder that it was necessary to take care of herself, lest she should endanger a coming life. Her inquiries were incessant, and at last Jude came down and told her there was no hope. As soon as she could speak, she informed him that she, what she had said to the boy, and how she thought herself the cause of this. No, said Jude, it was in his nature to do it. The doctor says there are such boys springing up amongst us, boys of a sort unknown in the last generation, the outcome of new views of life. They seem to see all its terrors before they are old enough to have the staying power to resist them. He says it is the beginning of the coming universal wish not to live. He's an advanced man, the doctor, 
but he can give no consolation to <gasps> Jude kept back his own grief on account of her, but now he broke down. And this stimulated Sue to efforts of sympathy, which in some degree distracted her from her poignant self-reproach. When everybody was gone, she was allowed to see the children. The boy's face expressed the whole tale of their situation. On that little shape had converged all the inauspiciousness and shadow which had darkened the first union, first union of Jew, and all the accidents, mistakes, fears, errors of the last. He was their nodal point, their focus, their expression in a single term. For the rashness of those parents he had groaned, for their ill assortment he had quaked, and for the misfortunes of these he had died. Then another silence, till she was seized with another uncontrollable fruit of grief. There is something external to us which says you shan't. First of all, it said you shan't learn. Then it said you shan't labor. Now it says you shan't love. He tried to soothe her by saying, that's bitter of you, darling. But it's true. Thus they waited. And she went back again to her room. The baby's frock, shoes, and socks, which had been lying on a chair at the time of his death, she would not now have removed, though Jude would fain have got them out of her sight. But whenever he touched them, she implored him to let them lie, and burst out almost savagely at the woman of the house when she also attempted to put them away. Jude dreaded her dull, apathetic silences almost more than her paroxysms. Why don't you speak to me, Jude, she cried out after one of these. Don't turn away from me. I can't bear the loneliness of being out of your looks. There, dear, here I am, he said, putting his face close to hers. Yes. Oh, my comrade, our perfect union, our two-in-oneness, is now stained with blood, shattered by death. That's all. Ah, but it was I who incited him, really, though I didn't know I was doing it. I talked to the child as one should only talk to people of mature age. I said the world was against us and that it was better to be out of life than in it at this price. And he took it literally. And I told him I was going to have another child. It, it upset him. Oh, how bitterly he upbraided me. Why did you do it so? I can't tell. It was that I wanted to be truthful. I couldn't bear deceiving him as to the facts of life, and yet I wasn't truthful. For with a false delicacy, I told him too obscurely. Why was I half wiser than my fellow women and not entirely wiser? Why didn't I tell him pleasant untruths instead of half realities? It was my want of self-control so that I could neither conceal things nor reveal them. Your plan might have been a good one for the majority of cases, only in our peculiar case it chanced to work out badly, perhaps. He must have known sooner or later. And I was just making my baby darling a new frock, and now I shall never see him in it and never talk to him anymore. My eyes are so swollen I can scarcely see, and yet Little more than a year ago, I called myself happy. We went about loving each other too much, indulging ourselves to utter selfishness with each other. We said, do you remember that we, should, we would make a virtue of joy? I said it was nature's intention, nature's law and raison d'etre that we should be joyful in what instincts she afforded us, instincts that, which civilization had taken upon itself to thwart. What dreadful things I said. 